I thought President Trump did an absolutely great job. I, I was really pleased with the, with the uh, tone. President Trump makes a new call for unity in his push for immigration reform, but some of his ideas are pushing people farther apart. You know, the real state of the union here under Trump is one of chaos, division, pitting one group of Americans against another. We'll look closer at the divide and the options for compromise after the president's State of the Union address. Good morning and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. President Trump used his State of the Union address to outline his four pillars for immigration reform. The plans could bring big changes in Texas. Anna Wernicke reports on the reaction from the people who will have to make it happen. Lawmakers from both parties. I call upon all of us to set aside our differences. President Donald Trump's plea to unite Congress on Tuesday may have worked. The president laid out his four-pillar immigration plan, giving some Republicans and Democrats something they can agree on. Distant relatives. They don't like it. It was a very uh, transformative speech for some of us last night. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi says the president's plan is offensive. The president presents himself as generous toward dreamers. But he's holding them hostage to the most extreme anti-immigrant agenda in generations. President Trump says his plan includes a path to citizenship for DACA recipients and dreamers. But he also says he wants to limit the number of family members an immigrant can sponsor, so-called chain migration. And the president wants to beef up immigration law enforcement and improve border security, including $25 billion for a border wall. I'm not against any of the four pillars. I'm just saying we have to have a plan B. Florida Republican Senator Marco Rubio says if the president wants lawmakers on board, he needs to be sure Democrats know his priorities. And Rubio says the president should be willing to focus on one issue at a time. Maybe we only do two pillars. And the two most important pillars are border security and, and DACA. On national security, I agree with the president. But Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn says the president's plan was exceedingly generous. I support his call for greater bipartisanship. Cornyn said in a video posted to Twitter, Twitter on Wednesday that he hopes lawmakers can work together to pass an immigration bill in the next few weeks. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. We want to get some different perspectives on the president's State of the Union message. We're joined by Tyler Norris, a Republican political consultant, and Ed Espinosa, the executive director at Progress Texas. Welcome. Good to be here. Ed, let's start with you. Mm -hmm. So we heard Senator Cornyn just now call the, the, the plan that the president was outlining very generous. Uh -huh. He's hoping for bipartisan support. Is that going to happen? I think we all want some sort of bipartisan support in government in general, it's something that people like to believe in. But with something like this, it's difficult, especially when you're using a community of people, roughly 1.8 million, or I can't remember the exact number, but number of dreamers as a bargaining chip. That's why many Democrats have said, let's have a clean DACA bill, which is let's just vote on DACA, and then let's vote on the other pieces. And look, Republicans have the votes. They have the majority in the Senate and in the House, and they have the White House. If they want to pass a wall, they can pass a wall on their own. They can do DACA on their own. Let's, we don't have to do these together. Let's do them separately and not hold these people as a bargaining chip. You know, Tyler, Senator Cruz has not been a big fan of the president's outline for a path to citizenship for dreamers. Is there a compromise there to be had? Well, there might be, but I agree with Nancy Pelosi. This is a pretty big game changer. It's an extremely generous bill for Democrats. It allows 1.8 million people to have a pathway to citizenship between 10 and 12 years from now. And all they're asking for is $25 billion to build the wall and to have more border security. So I think there's a compromise to be found, but unfortunately, there's enough not to like for both sides to make this an iffy deal in the Senate. Well, we want to play a clip where the president calls for ending what he says is chain migration. The camera is focused on the reaction in the chamber. Listen. Under the current broken system, a single immigrant can bring in virtually unlimited numbers of distant relatives. Under our plan, we focus on the immediate family by limiting sponsorships to spouses and minor children. Well, you could hear all the boos in the room right there. Why do you feel like this uh, message is so divisive for the people in the room and for people across the country? Well, you've got two parties focused on different things. Uh, Democrats want uh, this to be a way that more and more people can come across the southern border 
doesn't matter really where they're from, but they don't really want limits on who can come across. And it's called chain migration. There's other names for it. But Republicans are focused, I think, on fixing the problem of getting control of the border and control of our immigration so we can decide who comes here, not anybody else. You know, the president brought in the parents of some teen girls that were killed by gang members, and a lot of people have criticized him for possibly using immigrants, uh, you know, painted as criminals as a way to get his message out. Yep. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's, it's a poor representation of immigrants, right? More people are killed in this country by Anglos and citizens than any other group. So why, you know, it, to, to say that all immigrants are criminals is a, a gross misrepresentation. And the other name for chain migration, by the way, is family migration. And that's what it traditionally has been. When you go back hundreds of years and look at people who have come to America, they've come with their families, they've brought their families, and it's not always a nuclear family of parents and children. Sometimes it's aunts and uncles, particularly if they are refugees or if they are people from circumstances where their nuclear family isn't the same anymore. So I think that these are we, we can't mischaracterize immigrants when we are a country built upon immigrants. And to bring up that example, I think is part of the mistrust that fractures the potential bipartisanship because he brings up like things like that. So if he says he's for immigration reform and then he brings something like that up about, about you know, these, these, these crimes, people are skeptical of his true motives and what he's going to do down the road. You know, the border wall is a key part of his plan for border security, mm -hmm. and it seems like he was trying to plant the seed for compromise. Is there room for a deal here? I think everybody's in favor of border security, whether or not it's a border wall of some sort. But look, the border wall, the big problem that people have had with it is that it doesn't solve the problems that he is trying to talk about. Forty percent of immigrants who come here fly here and they overstay their visas. No wall is going to stop that. So if you're looking at spending $25 billion on a wall, it's not going to solve the problem that you think you're talking about. It is a $25 billion piece of symbolism that says we don't want you here. And that is the wrong message to send to any community. Clearly, you can't talk about the wall and not talk about Texas. I mean, what part of that message is going to impact Texas? Well, it's a tough deal for Texans. I mean, we have more border, shared border with Mexico than any other state, and obviously a lot of that's impassable territory, so we don't need to build walls there. But um, Texas is going to be the focus of this bill, without a doubt. I think we have uh, more people here illegally or more people here from south of the border than almost any other state. And so it, where this bill goes is ultimately going to focus on Texas elected officials and what they're willing to compromise on. Yeah, what does happen next? Well, we'll see. Um, I, like I said, there's a, there's a lot in here for everyone to dislike, and the Senate threshold of 60 votes to get past a filibuster means that, uh, well, I don't think we have any idea where this bill will end up. We live in very unpredictable times right now, especially in the last year and a half, so even for people like Tyler and I who have been doing this for a long time and normally might be able to forecast some sort of prediction, it's very hard to figure out what's going to happen right now. Ed, Tyler, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having thanks. us. As America regains its strength, opportunity must be extended to all citizens. President Trump surprised some people when he said he wants to help inmates find jobs after prison. Some of those ideas are already taking hold. Find out how Texas is leading the way. Money you pay in taxes and fees may not be going where it's supposed to go. How a budget trick is taking those tax dollars from environmental efforts. Our military is looking for a few good men and women, but few young people in Texas can meet their standards. And that has lawmakers looking for solutions. President Trump surprised some people in his State of the Union address when he called for prison reform and steps to help prisoners find jobs. As America regains its strength, opportunity must be extended to all citizens. That is why this year we will embark on reforming our prisons to help former inmates who have served their time get a second chance at life. The president's proposal received applause from members on both sides of the aisle. The idea also has bipartisan support here in Texas, and a conservative group is playing a key role in the push for reform. 
For some insight, we're joined by Derek Cohen, the director of the Center for Effective Justice and Right on Crime at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Welcome. Glad to be here. What did you think of what the president had to say? It was very encouraging. It was very encouraging to hear the president actually devote precious time in the State of the Union to the issue of prison reform. You know, in the past, prison reform has been a liberal issue, um, but now um, many conservatives are uh, speaking about it, even the Koch brothers. What do you think about that? Well, I'd, I'd push back on the fact that it's uh, the preconception that it's a liberal issue. We've been doing it uh, on a bipartisan basis here in Texas for at least 10 years. Back in the 2007 session, you know, a, a Democrat senator, uh, uh, John Whitmire, a uh, Republican House uh, Correction Chairman, Jerry Madden, you know, they were the ones who really pioneered this, this model of correction that we're seeing rolling out across the nation, and they worked uh, fantastically across party lines. You know, your group, TPPF, has been working on some criminal justice priorities in uh, recent sessions, like the, um, you know, the, the other group that you're part of, Right for Crime, uh, uh, Right on Crime, sorry. Uh, so <laughs> I just wondered, uh, what are you kind of seeing with the successes of that, and what are some of the other ideas that you have planned? Well, the important thing to remember is that while this originated in Texas, Public safety is a universal, uh, a, a universal appeal issue. Um, in Texas, though, we really went forward with an idea of doing public safety right, doing public safety first, and then worry about issues of decarceration, issues of sentencing for things like that. So that was always in the front of our mind. So with that specifically, if Texas can do it, you know, just like it took uh, Nixon to go to China, if Texas can reform its criminal justice system, anyone can too. And we've seen states like Mississippi, Georgia, um, Louisiana, all these red states have done similar reforms. You know, that soundbite that we listened to from President Trump was only about 20 seconds, and then he didn't say much else on the issue after that. Do you feel like this is going to be an empty promise since there wasn't a lot of talk from him? Not at all. Not at all. Yesterday in West Virginia at the retreat, he did about a minute and a half on, uh, on the same thing. He expanded upon that. Uh, we've seen White House putting out, uh, you know, communications uh, reemphasizing that as well. This is, you know, from what we understand both uh, in the executive and in Congress, this is going to be an issue moving forward. It's going to be a high priority and it's going to be soon. Yeah, what are those priorities? What can they do and how soon? Well, the low-hanging fruit here is, is prison reform. And by prison reform, I mean specifically reentry, not touching issues of mens rea, not touching issues of sentencing, these issues that tend to uh, raise hackles on different people for different reasons. But this is an issue of people that are coming out of prison regardless. Are we doing all we can to make sure that they're not a part of the uh, frequent flyer club and end up back there later? And that can be through uh, getting the government out of their way when it comes to licensing, providing education, also just making sure that there is a warm handoff from the facility uh, to any sort of uh, reentry services that exist in the community. Derek Cohen, thank you for being with us. Anytime. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson arrived in Mexico Thursday, kicking off a week-long trip through Latin America. But before he started the trip, Tillerson made a stop in Austin to visit his alma mater. As Steffi Lee shows us, Tillerson spoke at the University of Texas about key issues he plans to address on the trip. Today we have an opportunity to further our economic partnership and the prosperity of the peoples in this hemisphere. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is on his five country trip through Latin America, focused on putting pressure on the Venezuelan president. Our position has not changed. We urge Venezuela to return to its constitution, to return to free, open, and democratic elections, and to allow the people of Venezuela a voice in their government. Thank you for your support. We really need help of the international community. The president of the Austin Venezuelan Association says she's grateful this issue is getting attention. We want people to know what's going on in Venezuela, that all human rights are being violated by the government. During the stop at his alma mater, Tillerson also said NAFTA needs to be modernized. Our aim is simple, to strengthen our economy and that of all of North America, to remain the most competitive economically vibrant region in the world. An issue experts say remains a challenge for the Trump administration. The Trump administration argues that uh, cheap labor in places like Mexico is undercutting the American economy. So Trump is looking uh, for ways to renegotiate NAFTA to protect more American workers and to protect more American companies. So this is a step back on free trade by Tillerson and, and Trump. And it's a balance. Tillerson and the White House will continue facing beyond this trip. Steffi Lee for State of Texas.
Tillerson says addressing corruption in the Western Hemisphere will require strengthening the judicial system. After visiting Mexico, Tillerson will travel to Argentina, Peru, Colombia, and Jamaica. Money you send to the state may not be going where it's supposed to be spent. And in every instance, whether it's big or small, it's breaking the promise to the Texas taxpayer. Millions in taxes and fees dedicated to improving the environment are going to pay for other projects. We'll look at who's losing out and where the money's going next on State of Texas. We're taking a new look at accusations that Texas lawmakers are intentionally misleading taxpayers. Millions in taxes and fees that appear to be dedicated to improving the environment siphoned away to pay for other projects. It's a budget trick and it's legal, but is it honest? KXAN's Phil Prazen has been following the money trail for years and found the impact is growing. You pay a state fee when you buy a new car or transfer a title. Money collected there is dedicated to help businesses and organizations change over their large fleets of vehicles, like turning dirty diesel school buses into environmentally friendly ones. But according to state documents, $1.7 billion from those fees won't be spent, but instead used to balance the books. This money should be spent on cleaning up the air. Luke Metzer from Environment Texas just paid a title fee and wants his money spent on the issue he cares about. It's outrageous that we have $1.7 billion sitting in a bank account that we could spend to solve this problem, but legislators are irresponsibly um, you know, doing budget tricks. The emission reduction plan is just one account. There are around 200 others. And if lawmakers decided to spend the money on their intended purposes, there'd be more than a $5 billion hole in the budget. And in every instance, whether it's big or small, it's breaking the promise to the Texas taxpayer. Senator Kirk Watson voted for the budget. He says to pass it, yeah, state leaders make deals, adding things that he and other lawmakers want. It's done so that members don't find themselves having to say, we're for fees or taxes. You know, we need to spend the money where we say we're going to. But then oil tanked. One of the items lead budget writer Senator Jane Nelson is working on this year is to stop relying on budget gimmicks. It's very important to me. So you'll be working on this? Oh yeah, oh yeah. But as to why not spend the money where it's supposed to go, she says the unspent fees from all the dedicated funds make up 9% of the budget. So you'd have to come up with that additional 9% funding, which is a chunk of change. <laughs> That was Phil Prazen reporting. Here's a closer look at one way the state takes money designated for one purpose and uses it to pay for something else. Employers in Texas pay a tax based on wages paid. The money goes into the employment and training investment holding to be used for the Texas Workforce Commission's Skill Development Program, or it can be transferred to the Unemployment Compensation or Training Stabilization Funds. Texas expects to collect more than $227 million from this tax on businesses over over the next two years, but the state only plans to spend a fraction of that, just over 772000 The rest, more than a quarter billion, is left in the account and lawmakers can decide how to spend it during the next session. The three people who have the biggest say in where your money goes are Speaker Joe Strauss, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, and Governor Greg Abbott. In the past, all three have said they want to wean the state off of the process, but they resorted to it again in 2017 to make the budget work. We reached out to their offices for comment and have not heard back. Thank you for joining us for State of Texas. Stay tuned for Meet the Press coming up at 9. I'm Josh.